So it's Friday, so it's time for poets. Some of us know that as push off early tomorrow's Saturday, but in this context, it's the perioperative enhancement team. Inspired by Dr. Sol Aronson and the team at Duke, a selection of clips to get us thinking about the next steps in providing world-class perioperative care. You'll find the full lectures in our back catalogue, or join us at the upcoming perioperative practicum for expert discussions, business case tips, and hands-on workshops. Go to www.ebpom.org and look for our international program of perioperative practicums. Top Med Talk. And I'm joined today by Dr. Alan Ellen Flanagan. She's an anesthesiologist and medical director of the Duke Preoperative Assessment Testing Clinic. We have Dr. Attila Kett, an anesthesiologist uh, and the chairman at St. Pa- St. Peter's University Hospital in New Jersey. We have Lynn Reed, CRNA and chief clinical officer at the AANA or American Society or <laughs> American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. I can get that out today. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us and sitting down with us today to have a discussion about perioperative care and what's going on here in the U.S. Dr. Flynn, I want to start with you and just ask, as a leader in your institution, how are you driving better perioperative care through your, your preoperative clinic? I think that education of our mid-levels has been really key, just to get everyone up to standard and to increasingly move towards evidence-based protocols. And that fits nicely into all of our ERAS protocols as well as our optimization clinics. So I think that's where we've been focusing most of our efforts. And then we've also been working on the more practical component of getting records in a timely fashion, in particular for patients that come on the day or the day before surgery. For instance, the to me, one of the most difficult patient populations is the GI patients. So we're a tertiary referral center, and they're coming to Duke in a largely outpatient clinic, but they're coming to Duke because nobody else wants to do them. So they tend to have significant morbidity, and uh, making sure that they come to us in the first place with what we need has been a challenge. And in fact, any patient population that's not either in your electronic, your EMR Um, so they're outside of network patients that come from different countries. It seems like if they're coming to Duke for a particular surgery, say brain surgery or some of the more complex backs, they're coming to see a particular surgeon, they'll have all their records with them. But this other patient population, they're very high risk and it's hard to get enough information on them to feel really secure in your workup of these patients to deliver the safe anesthetics. So how, how long have you been um, running this preoperative clinic? I mean, how, what is the time frame? Yeah, so I've been running it for about a year and a half. Okay. Before that, we had a family medicine doc mm-hmm. who was basically in charge of it. So we changed our model a little bit more to just anesthesiologists and having people that have a particular interest in perioperative care. Yeah. And then the other thing that we've had to contend with this year is having more junior trainees come join our clinic, which has been very interesting because it used to be that the residents at the end of their training would come to preoperative clinic and they had a lot more to offer. So now we're dealing with PGY1, PGY2, so interns and first-year anesthesia residents who, who don't have much background. And so the good part is that we're having to train them right yeah. <laughs> up front, um, the hard part is that they require a whole lot more of our time. Uh, are you bringing other mis- multidisciplinary specialties in oh, the yeah. clinic? And how does that, I mean, how are you working together collaboratively to, to improve patient Yeah, care? I would say that the collaborative nature of my job is the best part of my job, just because if you're interested in perioperative medicine, you're trying to figure out how to take care of the patient and the people that you work with are sincerely also interested in that. So we do have uh, our this main screening clinic, and then we've got our POET clinics, our perioperative enhancement team clinics that come off of our screening clinic. So those are very well established for about 15% of the patients, 15 to 20%. Um, but then there's all the rest of the patients that come through our clinic that may need 
some sort of attention or optimization, but they don't either have time. Usually they don't have time to go through the whole, a uh, whole poet yes. program. Yeah. So, so Ellen, have you guys, what are the outcomes, changes in outcomes that you've seen, uh, especially in this GI population? I'm sure that you've yeah. looked at before and after. Okay. Yeah. It, well, improvements in care and patient satisfaction, getting patients through quicker and less cancellations. We've had to make a good argument for being able to send more of our patients over to the main hospital, working out things like uh, significant valvular stenosis or pulmonary hypertension patients that those really are not patients that we want in that setting. And so that's really had us drill down to uh, where we were getting into, where we're having problems. Yeah. So you've made it, been able to make a financial case as well. Easy. Yeah. 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 Uh, Attila, can you tell us a little bit about what your experience is up at St. Peter's and in, in the perioperative space, what you guys are doing to improve care? Yeah, St. Peter's is a very unique institution. We are uh, one of the largest perinatal centers in the Northeast. So uh, our experience, we started with obstetrics. We deliver over 6,000 babies. And we were the first in the country to develop an ERAS program for obstetrics. So this is a very unique scenario, you know, you guys dealing with uh, how to connect primary care providers with specialists. This is a scenario where the obstetrician is the primary care provider and the surgeon at the same place. So that kind of made our job a little bit easier. But we had the challenges that there was no templates to follow, at least in this country. So I reached back and I reached, I'm originally from Europe, but I reached to England where we see a lot of people from here, and uh, we connected with Dr. Rian Wrench from Sheffield, who literally uh, guided us through uh, implementing this program. So we started about two and a half years ago uh, with a pilot, which we completed in less than a year, and now it's uh, going full-fledged, and uh, we have um, hundreds of patients went through this program already, we have some impressive metrics. Uh, in this country, the average length of stay uh, after C-section is 3.7 days. That's approximately where we started. We are at 2.4 right mm. now. And, uh, you know, considering we also did cost studies, uh, we looked at our own data. We looked at very conservatively only direct variable costs. We have the advantage that we're looking at two patients at the same time. If the mom goes home, the baby goes home as well. So we uh, found that uh, one day on the postpartum floor is about $900. The nursery is about $570. So with the 1.25, 1.3 days reduction length of stay, we're saving approximately $2,000. Now, you have to look at that uh, C-section is the most frequently performed procedure in this country. We do 1.3 uh, million C-sections. So uh, ERA is probably less applicable for the emergency C-sections, but certainly for the elective C-sections, which is about 45% of those C-sections, mm -hmm. if we're able to uh, do what uh, the UK was able to do and make it standard of practice, looking at half a million C-sections. $2,000 a piece, that's a billion dollars. Hmm. Definitely significant, <laughs> significant yeah. difference there. Wow. That's amazing. So, um, you know, I, I get the question a lot. What does your protocol look like, you know, for whatever service line? Can you talk to us maybe just specifically about the multimodal pain uh, management approach that you sure. do for your patients? You know, and that's kind of dealing with the opioid crisis as well. We know a mm -hmm. lot of C-section Moms right. go home with a lot of pain meds. Right. Actually, that's kind of like if our OB ERAS, what we started two and a half years ago, was OB ERAS 1. Now we actually, in the last six months, we're turning into OB ERAS 2. So we looked at our original protocol was an alternating on steroidal and Tylenol, starting with intravenous uh, going to day 2 to PO, Motrin and uh, Tylenol. And with the use of this and the somewhat reduced dose of intratecal morphine, we were able to reduce our opioid use from 59 morphine milliequivalent to 32. 
Now in the last six months, we went further and we supplementing this with long-acting uh, local anesthetic Expiral. Uh, we have actually been part of a multi-center study, Duke, Brigham, and MGH are the main enrollers in this study. That's one approach, but on the same token, we're also doing a three-layer infiltration study where the surgeon infiltrates an ATCC dilute volume. And with those cases, we already have some preliminary data. So from these cases, which are already getting the multimodal approach, we mentioned 59 to 32, these patients are down to 11. Uh, more familiar wow. equivalent. That so, is phenomenal. And uh, what's interesting also that uh, 50% of them get no narcotics in the hospital and going home with no narcotics. Now we're looking at the possibility of using technology very extensively with these patients. We have a cell phone app. They uh, basically ed we educate. Expectation management is huge with this patient population. But also, we are working on now a way to find out how we're going to be able to, to follow them to know exactly how much narcotics they use, when they run out, if they run out, how we're able to supply them if they need some. And that would enable us to actually send home more liberally patients with no narcotics whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So because that's the key, yeah. how do you help with shared decision-making with those patients that you actually have them agreed to go home with not. <laughs> yeah. So are you looking at the number of patients that receive no narcotics in, say, the 24 hours prior to admission and those patients don't get any opioids? I wouldn't say definitely they won't get. It's really a discussion mm -hmm. with the patients. It has many, many things come into it, obviously, when weekends are coming and yes. more difficult yes. to supply, that's another factor to look at it. So there is, at this point, there is not a definite rule or a formula or algorithm, but we are certainly moving that way, looking at developing a tool, what would help us to, mm -hmm. to, to decide that which patients are appropriate, but still I believe shared decision-making is key here yeah. because the patient has to be agreeing. And uh, the other tool, uh, in two months, uh, uh, we will have e-prescribing capability, and that will help a lot mm -hmm. to, to, to supplement if needed. So what sort of information do you give to your patients when they're, say, leaving the hospital um, regarding multimodal analgesia, in particular, say, doses and scheduling of their Tylenol and ibuprofen? We... Uh, First of all, all of our information, what we give out, is based on a cell phone app. So, okay. so we educate these patients. They get the app uh, four weeks prior. Uh, and uh, how we came about it is we realized it's going to be a big task to implement OB eras because of market law, because of the history in this country, Kaiser 20 years ago tried to do it without the tools and wasn't very successful. So now there is a law existing in the market law that patients have the right to, st insurance companies has to pay for four days. So therefore, we really made the case that the goal is not to send home anybody early. The goal is to, to set the expectations right and have the patients educated enough to see whether they meet the necessary uh, yardsticks. They, they reach those goals, what they have to reach, and they make the decision that, mm -hmm. yeah, I am ready, I'm going home. So during this process, they are being educated about multimodal analgesia as well. They know importance of taking uh, non-narcotics around the clock, not just PRN mm -hmm. basis and they go home with the appropriate uh, Tylenol and Motrin, and they take it around the clock. So. Mm -hmm. We're really fortunate at Duke that we've got this perioperative pain care clinic, which is one of the POET clinics. So uh, patients come in that score high on opioid risk with the opioid risk tool can go off to perioperative pain, and we've got much better management there. They can be seen, say, 30 days before up until 90 days after, which is a luxury for the surgeons. Still remains that you've got 80% um, of the other patients that you're coming in to see face-to-face, -face, and we're doing a lot of work on managing patient expectation. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I mean, it's the being able to hit the patient preoperatively and, and setting standards, setting expectations. It's huge. Lynn, um, we would talk a lot about health literacy and reaching out patients, shared decision um, making. What are your uh, thoughts on, on that and how we go forward reaching that patient population? So I think I'm going to back up one little minute oh, to just to just appreciate what Ellen said because I come from a community hospital background, a little di- different than the academic centers. But I think that as we implement across um, community hospitals, ASCs, office practices, wherever, because all of these things can be integrated in any anesthesia practice. And we found in the work that we did many years ago was engaging with the surgeon's staff yeah. was the big win because they were the ones that wanted to make sure the patient was successful and their surgeon, pr- proceduralist, whoever was most successful. So I think engagement with them so that it became a very clear communication pathway from primary care, specialty care, it, through the surgeon, anesthesia, if it's in patient hospitalists, and back out again so that we were really trying to build that seamless experience for the patient at that time that is so incredibly, remains so incredibly challenging with our disparate information technology systems that aren't mm-hmm. even talking with each other yet. Yeah. Um, we could go on about yeah. that. <laughs> but as far as patient literacy, I think that's a huge opportunity in our country. We've created a high deductible where you're supposed to be able to make a decision suddenly about health care. Moving from Canton, Ohio to Chicago, Illinois, I am not savvy. Yeah. I am. I truly don't have that competency that I had to seek care that I had where I lived for 58 years. So how do we make it really evident? And I think you're doing a great job Thank with you. really creating a system that gives the patient the milestone so they understand Mm -hmm. what, you understand what their expectations are, they understand what yours are. So you're really in that patient-directed collaborative care. So maybe that we can't inform everyone far out ahead that you're really, you've both created great systems to support the patient and their family and caregivers in that. Any final thoughts? Uh, Yeah, I have actually a comment regarding that. Uh, I think... uh, expectation management is one thing what we also have to provide and what our system with our technology is able to provide is a way to follow up these patients afterwards Mm -hmm. and we have a cloud-based dashboard so we have as you said commented on surgeon staff surgeon staff we have a dedicated nurse who who follows up looking at this dashboard every single day the patient fills up fills up a questionnaire every Mm -hmm. single day and they able to see how those patients are doing, identifying yes. patients early at risk, intervene. We were able to uh, prevent wound infections, readmissions with mm-hmm. this tool, and that's I believe, is, is also very much key. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favorite social media feed is, We're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com, and get on board with the email updates. Oh, whilst you're at it as well, I suggest you download our entire back catalogue. We're categorising at the moment. We're having a little look through it. It may not always be in the form that you currently find it. So if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website, perhaps, or perhaps through your podcatcher. Oh, and if you fancy meeting us, why not go to the website ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event is EBPOM USA, the Dallas Masters course, a perioperative care practicum. Have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. ebpom.org forward slash meetings.